Um, again, my name is Justin Mayer. I uh, come from Santa Monica, California. Um, I work on a number of different projects. One I launched most recently is called uh, Fortressa, which allows you to deploy your own private self-contained uh, VPN server. Um, another uh, project that I work on is called Monitorial. It's a server security monitoring solution. And in my very limited spare time, I work on a, uh, I, I maintain a static site generator called Pelican. I don't have time for questions. I'm gonna use the whole 30 minutes, uh, at least I intend to. Um, and, um, uh, but please come up to me afterwards. I would love to, I'd love to talk to you. So come on down and, and, uh, and chat. Um, today I wanna to talk about protecting privacy and security. And you know, I'm using them somewhat interchangeably. Obviously they're, they're a little different, but um, you know, 500 years ago, uh, if someone knew everything there was to know about you, um, they really couldn't do very much with that information. But in the 21st century, there's a lot that people can do with that information as it relates to your security. So um, I, if I say one, sometimes I mean the other throughout the talk. Um, you know, and, and us as developers, protecting privacy and security is, is more important than it is for, for most people. You know, if you think about uh, someone who, say, is an accountant uh, for work, they you know, they touch all these documents every day, you know, they should probably wash their hands. It seems important, it seems like a good thing to do. But if you're, say, a, a doctor, a surgeon, and you're putting your hands inside other people's bodies, um, it's really important that you wash your hands. And so I kind of think of, uh, you know, this is something that we should be doing as it relates to privacy and security. Uh, you know, we, we control passwords to critical systems. Um, we have access to you know, sometimes thousands or millions of, of uh, personal data records. So we should treat that with a good degree of care. And so my goal is that by the end of this talk, you know, you'll be inspired to, to protect uh, you know, the privacy, not just for yourself, but for your users, for your friends, for your family, your communities, your startup, um, but really everyone in, in all of your different communities. And you know, when the security and privacy issues started, you know, it's, it was kind of like a trickle, and then it was a leak, and now it's just a full-blown flood. Um, and you know, there's not a, a week that goes by without some, some terrible breach of, of some kind or other. And the privacy breaches are, you know, sometimes they're accidental, and sometimes they're intentional, because companies, their business model depends on, on data mining you know, your private information. Um, and these, these privacy breaches are, are even more worrisome. And you know, there's, let's talk about you know, a little bit about what this data is. You know, it, it can be referred to as personally identifiable information, or PII. It can be uh, birth dates, uh, social security, pension numbers, uh, national ID numbers, street addresses, email addresses, uh, employment information, income data. And that's just the textual data. Um, what about photographs? Um, we sometimes have now thousands of photographs of ourselves throughout our whole lives. Um, that can be used for facial recognition, for all kinds of things, uh, fingerprints, uh, iris scans, um, location data. Uh, you know, every place you go with your smartphone, and let's not kid ourselves, that's everywhere you go. Because um, how many times do you go somewhere without your smartphone? So all of that information um, can be used uh, for all kinds of purposes that you may not like or intend. And you can find out, you know, sometimes what those, uh, you know, which of your data has been uh, found and in which breaches. Um, there's a site called Have I Been, Have I Been Pwned? I don't even know how you pronounce that. Um, but, uh, and the answer to, you know, Have I Been Pwned is most likely you have. Um, when, when I put, you know, my information in there, um, this is a screenshot, and if I found any number of uh, services that had uh, breaches that contained some of my information or other. Um, so the question is, what can we do about this? Um, and there are some things that we, that we can do to make the situation a little better. I want to touch on encrypted DNS. This was something I was interested in for, for a time. Um, you know, it seemed like this uh, sort of last mile type of thing where, you know, we make these requests and they're really unprotected. Your ISP can see, well, your ISP can see everything you do anyway. Um, but if you, uh, you know, if you use certain, uh, you know, it, it just it just bothered me that these requests are, are insecure. And so I, I played around with uh, DNS crypt for a while and actually used it for you know probably a year, maybe two, I can't remember. And I had some issues with latency sometimes, and sometimes a server would go would go down, and I would think it was my ISP, and it was actually the the DNS resolver on the other end, and I would have to go and switch resolvers, and then everything would work again. 
Um, and then on top of that, uh, the, the creator of it um, decided that he kind of wanted to go in a different direction and mothballed it, kind of put it into cold storage and then created a new thing. It was like DNS over TLS. Uh, and so it, the whole thing is so confusing and uh, in flux that for me, I decided to just go in a, in a different uh, direction. And by the way, I'm going to have a lot of links in this presentation. Don't feel like you need to write everything down. You, you'll, you'll get copies of it later. So, um, so I'm sort of over for now the DNS encryption thing until they sort it out. So instead, I decided to focus more on uh, virtual private networks. Um, and I first started with SSH tunneling because you get some similar benefits, and I already had a virtual private server I could use, and I could just tunnel through it. Um, but there's some limitations to doing things that way that I don't have time to go into. And so, so I eventually switched to using a VPN. And, and there's different kinds of virtual private networks. The traditional kind is you want to log into your company network when you're not there, uh, or you want to log into your home via your home router when you're not there and, and access things securely. But a more recent usage of VPNs is to protect your privacy uh, on untrusted networks, which is more and more uh, common because we're traveling more airports, hotels, um, all kinds of cafes, all kinds of places that we use these untrusted um, and often unprotected networks. And a VPN can help protect you from what you're doing. They're even beneficial when you're at home and at work, um, but uh, I'll leave you to, to figure out what some of those benefits are. Um, the, there's a problem, though, with VPNs is that the major commercial providers, they're, they're logging. Um, uh, they say they aren't logging, but they have the potential to log um, uh, huge troves of information. All of every site you visit, everything you do via that VPN, they can see. Um, and that's a lot of trust to be putting into a provider. So um, some enterprising individuals built something called um, Algo, um, which is a set of uh, uh, Ansible configuration. Ansible is a Python-based configuration management tool, for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, and uh, Algo is a, is a great way of um, deploying um, uh, your own VPN server. You can use DigitalOcean, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, um, a whole bunch. They're adding new providers all the time. And this is really great for, for us, because we know what a terminal is. Um, and so, but I would have people ask me, like people who aren't in our industry, and they would say, hey, I know that I need a VPN. Um, I want one. Which one should I use? And I never had a good recommendation for them. Um, and I can't tell them, like, go use Algo, which is the, sort of the common response that I see people say, and that's great. But you know, these, they don't know what a terminal is. They're, they're not going to be able to, to do this without a lot of handholding. So I built a uh, very thin wrapper around Algo. It's basically Algo as a service. It's called Fortressa. Um, I really built it as a public service. This is not a money-making uh, enterprise. Uh, it's uh, really just meant to, uh, so that I can answer this question of how do I get a VPN of my own without uh, knowing what a terminal is. I'm going to touch briefly on disk encryption. And, and the reason that I'm touching on it briefly is that it's gotten better. It's, it's pretty easy to do these days. And, and why is it important, first of all? Disk encryption is important because of data at rest. So your notebook, uh, a phone, um, a server somewhere, if someone gets hold of your computer, they can pull the data off. If they grab a drive out of a server, they can get the data off. So it's important to have uh, data encrypted at rest. Um, this has gotten much easier, as I said. Um, there's, all, there's full disk encryption, and there's file system level. Um, there's, I don't have too much time to go into the differences, but the file system level um, doesn't protect swap and some other things that sometimes information can find its way onto. So full disk encryption is usually preferable. Um, on macOS, for example, uh, File Vault is the name of the encryption tool. It is a, is a button that you push and you put in your password, and, and now your disk is, is encrypted. Um, it's pretty much the same on most Linux uh, desktop distributions. The server side is a little more complicated. Um, anyone who's ever dealt with disk encryption on a server, one of the fun things that you get to do is when there's an unanticipated uh, server reboot, um, you have to be present in order to put in your encryption password, because otherwise, nothing else will start. So um, if your server goes down or your data center decides to, to do an unplanned uh, you know, outage in the middle of the night, you're going to wake up to people complaining that your site's down because you weren't awake to put in your encryption password. So it's a, it's a problem, but it's also uh, valuable for a lot of um, use cases. It's tough to do when you're doing cloud computing. Um, uh, so. Um, 
it's a little easier on AWS. Uh, we use a lot of Linode uh, instances, and um, there's no button you can push for Linode. Um, but this guide that we found um, on their site, it's, it's not exactly easy. It takes a little bit of time, but it is possible, and it works well. Um, and we've been doing that um, quite, uh, quite successfully. On the browser side of things, um, my, my first sort of uh, you know, request, if, if you haven't tried recently, is try Firefox. Um, and if you, if you can, use it, because they need to survive. Um, they're the only independent browser maker. You know, uh, look at the others. Google, right? Ad-driven company. Uh, you've got um, Microsoft, uh, Apple. These are the only other players when it comes to browsers. We need an independent browser maker, and you using Firefox helps them stay around. Um, but don't use it just because you want to help them. It's also a really great browser. Uh, particularly from Firefox 57 and above, um, they've really made some fantastic uh, improvements, and uh, I've been using it for a while, and I've been really, really happy with it. It's, um, I've, I greatly prefer it to, to Chrome, which, is, which seems to be popular um, these days. Um, some tools that I use just to block not only ads, but more importantly, the ad tracking. Um, the, the ads, I don't mind nearly as much as the ad tracking, you know, multi-megabyte JavaScript payloads that, that get, uh, you know, um, foisted on you. And so I use uh, AdGuard, AdBlocker. Uh, Tamper Monkey is a um, user script management tool, and one of the user scripts I use is an uh, anti-AdBlock killer, um, which stops the people who are trying to block you from using AdBlock. Can't wait for the anti-AdBlock -anti killer killer. Um, I know that's coming soon. Um, uh, so on, on Safari, on, on Mac OS, I use another tool called Cookie. It's a great cookie management tool. So if um, you want to manage uh, you know, which cookies are whitelisted, which are blacklisted, which uh, are deleted after a certain period of time, um, it's a very useful tool. Um, outside of Safari, there's uh, Umatrix and Ublock, both uh, tools from, from this repository. And um, uh, both great tools for um, sort of like, you know, web firewall and, and ad blocking and, and ad tracking blocking, respectively. Um, if you really want to dig into it, um, there's, this is a guide to, uh, it's called Firefox Configuration Guide for Privacy Freaks, which I loved, right? Because privacy freaks, because, I mean, you'd have to be a freak to care about your privacy, right? Um, and, and if you read this tool, you might read it and be like, Okay, no, really, this, this is for freaks. It's, uh, it's, it's really detailed. Um, but I think if you read it, you'll find, find something in it that's useful. Sending files, to me, this is something that comes up not every day, but at least a few times a year. I need to send a file to someone that I don't know very well. They're not on Slack. They're not on some messaging tool that I use. And so I have no way of really providing them with a file. And so Firefox has this great sort of you know, laboratory project called Firefox Send. It's, uh, I think it's peer-to-peer, -peer, kind of browser-to-browser. -browser. I don't recall the, how exactly it does it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very secure way of sending a file. No one has to create an account or register for anything. Uh, I re recommend checking that out. Um, another great tool is One Time Secret. Um, I've used this dozens and dozens of times, where you need to send someone, you know, sometimes it's someone on your team, and you don't want it appearing in your Slack history or uh, your Messenger history. And it's like a, an API key or, or a password of some kind. You can put it into one time secret, generates a link, you send that person the link, they open it, they can only view it one time, they copy it, they paste it into their password manager or other secure vault, and it's then burned and not viewable ever again. Um, the people that run it are very transparent. They're like, hey, look, you know, we don't view any of this stuff, even if we did. All it is is just a string of data. We don't know what it is. You know, you agree, it's an API key, but to what? Or it's a password. They don't know. On the hardware side of things, you know, we think about like the Amazon Echoes, where you've got this microphone that's on and listening to you all the time. You've got a computer that has, uh, you know, or, or a phone that's got a camera, a microphone, uh, location information. There's all of this stuff that you don't really have any control over. And there's this great company in California called uh, Purism, and they make a product line called Librem. They have 13 and 15 inch notebook models. Um, they're working on an 11 inch notebook tablet convertible where the screen detaches, I think. Um, and they have a phone coming out next year as well. Um, and these are great because everything top to bottom is, is built on open stuff. 
So the firmware is not some you know, binary blob. Uh, everything is reviewable. They try to make it as open as they possibly can. And the thing that I love about it most are the kill switches. They have actual hardware switches right there on the front of your machine so that you can sever the copper power connection between the microphone, the camera, the wireless uh, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So you can turn all that stuff off and feel confident that some software uh, exploit is not going to you know, silently turn them back on. Um, so I really love that about this line of machines. A good pairing with um, Librem um, is uh, Cubes. And this is a Linux distribution that is focused on compartmentalization. So you can have different virtual environments where you can have, this is my uh, you know, web browsing VM. And everything that you do in that sandbox is totally self-contained. It can be, you could click on a bad link and get totally compromised and have it not affect any of your other virtual environments on that machine. Um, you can create them, spawn, destroy, a lot of flexibility, um, really highly regarded by uh, a lot of security researchers. Um, you may be familiar with Tor. I wanted just to mention it out of completeness. Uh, Tor is an onion skin router. It's uh, useful as a complement, perhaps, to a VPN. Um, you know, there really isn't a great way to be anonymous. People think that, oh, I have a VPN, I'm anonymous. Uh, not, not really. Um, Tor can help you uh, get a little bit more um, uh, out of that from an anonymous perspective. Um, Onion Browser um, is a, an iOS uh, tool, so you can uh, run Onion Browser on your phone, um, on iPhones, and there's a, uh, one for Android devices called Orbot. When the internet started, you know, it was a bunch of these, um, we had protocols and we had federated services and we had email servers and web servers and IRC servers and Usenet for people that are old enough to remember Usenet. Um, and you know, over time, this got more and more broken down and, and consolidated. So now we've got these monolithic uh, silos controlled by you know, very large corporations. Um, and there's a, there's a move to, a movement to decentralize or, or re-decentralize, to take things back a little bit closer to where, the way they used to be. And, you know, we talked a little bit about one category, right, VPNs. You could use a large, you know, commercial provider or you can deploy your own server, you know, using Algo or, or Fortressa. Um, but what are some others? SyncThing is one that I've used for a few years now, um, and I use it as a replacement for Dropbox. It is a Golang-based uh, synchronization tool. I have it synchronizing between my desktop and, and uh, my notebook. Um, it's, uh, it's fast, uh, low CPU usage. Um, let's see, what else can I recommend about it? Really good release schedule. They release very frequently. Uh, really responsive, open source project. Um, highly recommended. If you have um, code repositories or, or issue tracking that you want to do and you don't want to use GitHub or, or, or Bitbucket, um, you can use GitLab's uh, hosted service, uh, gitlab.com. Um, you can also use their, um, their self-hosted, uh, which is what we use. And they have a, something called the Omnibus installer. Uh, it's very easy. Um, we use uh, Ubuntu, so it was simply an app get install, and we were up and running in, in almost no time at all. It's really easy to, to self-host. Um, uh, they have Kanban issue style uh, tracking. They've got continuous in integration continuous development, um, uh, integrated you know, uh, testing and, and build infrastructure. They've, they've added more features than I could possibly remember. A common saying in, in this industry is, you know, never host your own email. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I think that uh, it actually can be done and, 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 not, too, not, too uh, and, and not too hard. So I've been using Mail in a Box for a few years. It's, uh, again, Ubuntu, low-end server, um, you know, just a few dollars a month, and I get a full-blown email server that I can host, you know, hundreds of domains on if I so chose. Um, another one that you can look at, I don't even know how to pronounce it, um, is an OpenBSD tool. It's uh, more recent, but I wanted to at least mention it in case people are, uh, wanted some different options. So for, uh, so let's look now look at Slack. Um, you know, again, a lot of consolidation you know, one, one company, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people that use it. But what if you, you, know, you want to use your own and deploy your own? Um, so Matrix and, and Riot are, are uh, a combination that, that works well. Um, I noticed that uh, PyCon Slovakia, there, the chat room is powered by Riot, so that was, uh, was great. Uh, Mattermost is another one that you can take a look at. 
Mattermost is actually bundled also with GitLab. So if you install the Omnibus edition, you can just essentially check a box and get Mattermost uh, installed uh, for free. Um, and I think it includes some kind of single sign-on integration too, which is nice. Um, you know, Facebook is, uh, and, and other social networks are a prime example of, of this sort of, you know, consolidation. And um, I, you know, as a result, like I don't, I never share anything on Facebook. I, I just don't trust it. Um, so there's these things I want to share with friends and family, you know, things about my life, and I want to see what's going on in their life, but I just don't, I never go there um, because I don't trust them. And so I haven't had time yet, but I'm really excited to deploy my own uh, Mastodon server um, so that I can start doing that. Um, it's, a, it's a great um, you know, tool for that sort of thing. And again, it's federated. So things like you know, user and buddy, you know, your, your network is portable, um, and, and um, these different instances of Mastodon talk to one another, kind of the way the internet was supposed to be. Um, Instapaper and Pocket are, are popular for, uh, you know, like, I don't have time to read this now, so I'm just going to fling it over there and read it. Never. Um, but um, if, you, um, the, the, if you think about the number, I've probably put thousands of articles into, uh, into, wall, uh, I mean, into Instapaper. And that's now owned by Pinterest. Um, and, you know, in, uh, Instapaper and Pocket, not to pick on them or anything, but, you know, they're free. Um, so what does that mean? Like, how are they making money? I, this doesn't feel good for me. So um, Wallabag is a way for you to, to get around that. Um, and, you know, and again, I, I mention all of these things, not just for you, but again, I really want to underscore you know, for, for the community aspect of it, whether that's your friends, your family, your startup, uh, your open source project. These are things you can do uh, to benefit not just you, but the people that don't have the ability to do these things. So, you know, deploying your own services is great, um, but you also have to make sure that they're secure. And if you're going to host your own you know, service, you should make sure that it's, uh, you know, in, that all of the connections to and from it are encrypted. Um, if you haven't noticed, Google Chrome is going to flag uh, unencrypted HTTP sites as insecure in July. That's four months from now. So if you have something that you want anyone to view and you actually want them to be able to view it, like this is not a choice. This is something you have to do. Um, and sometimes we all love Python, and, but the Python packaging infrastructure can sometimes be a little uh, challenging for deployment. Uh, sometimes, you just, sometimes you just want a shell script, um, and here's one shell script that will get you your certificates. Just download the one file, run it, and you're off to the races. Talking about passwords brief, uh, briefly, you know, they are, they are everywhere. It is the default authentication method. Um, they are everywhere, and they are terrible. Um, I um, don't have time to go into why. Hopefully, you understand why. Uh, but um, you know, password managers can help with that. They can help generate secure passwords. You don't have to remember them. They have a good browser integration, and, um, they, and they store them securely. We're often told to use strong passwords. But unfortunately, everyone seems to have a different idea as to what strong means. Um, you know, some people say it's you know, this number of letters, you have to include a, a number, a dash, you can't use certain letters. It's, um, this gets tricky fast. Um, Django, for example, um, thankfully, includes some very good general password validators. Um, you don't have to use them, but if you want to, you get a pretty good set that are applicable to almost anyone. And um, a validator that you can add to that list if you are so inclined. Um, Troy Hunt is a security researcher, and he created an, an API called uh, Pwned Passwords. Um, and it's a, it's a trove of trillions, I think, maybe just billions, I don't remember, of, uh, of passwords that he's collected from, from uh, breaches. And so you can use um, another friend of mine named uh, Dan Lowenhertz wrote this uh, tool. Um, it's a Python uh, CLI command line um, uh, wrapper around this API. And so you can use that. Uh, he also created a Django validator that uses the Python library. And um, so you can, when the user puts in their password, you can have it dynamically check, oh, this is contained in this particular breach, and you can have that password rejected. Um, this is just a, you know, a drop in the bucket in terms of the things that you can do. Um, this guide is great. This is a, um, a uh, surveillance uh, self-defense guide from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, if, you know, for web application developers, 
go to sites like this, uh, Privacy Score, and, and I'm not sure how to pronounce the other one, um, but these tools are great because they will help you know, better understand what stuff can be done about your web application in terms of, you know, are you pulling in, you know, dynamic um, assets like scripts, fonts, CSS, that you potentially could instead be serving yourself um, and, and could save, uh, you know, some rogue, you know, if, if some CDN gets compromised, that becomes a very, you know, uh, juicy attack vector for someone. So that can help you really improve um, a lot of the things about your web application. Um, I gave a long talk at EuroPython last year on multi-factor authentication. Um, if you want to know more about it, um, you, can, you can watch that, but I want to at least touch on it briefly. Um, how many of you have ever used uh, multi-factor, two-factor authentication in some way? Awesome. Oh, that's, a really, that's a really great sign. That's fantastic. Now, how many of you have implemented it uh, in, in a project in any way? Okay. Much smaller number, but good to see some hands. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, some of the different ones in, in no particular order. Um, you know, biometrics is all the rage now. You know, we've got now face recognition on phones. Um, it's, it's great for usability. Um, it's not so great for security. Um, you know, it's, it's not revocable, right? We have one set of fingerprints and eyes and face. Uh, we can't say like, oh yeah, I want to, no, that's it. That's once it's compromised, it's compromised. Um, so as a second or third factor, sure. But if you ever see it used as a single factor, just run in the other direction fast. This is probably the most common SMS and phone call base um, uh, two-factor authentication. You get some code via text message. Um, it's very common. It's, uh, it's not great um, it, for a variety of reasons. It, it can be uh, compromised via social engineering. Um, there's the SS7. Uh, telephony interoperability attack. There's, there are ways in which it, it can be um, uh, you know, circumvented. So I'm not a real big fan. I, I think of it as being deprecated for, for me personally. Um, you know, if someone's asking for your phone number, when you, when, you go to your site, when you go to a particular site and you hit the button that says enable multi-factor authentication and they ask you for your phone number, you know something's wrong right there. Um, you know, some folks will say, well, it's better than, than not having multi-factor authentication. It's better than nothing. Um, and that's uh, true, but it's also kind of a cop-out because we have other better things, um, that, you know, some of which I'll mention. And, and the other reason that I don't like it is that it's unnecessary and it's, it's a privacy invasion. Um, you know, recently, in the last couple of weeks, there were accounts of Facebook spamming people on their phone numbers because they had entered it to secure their accounts. Um, and that's, again, this is exactly the sort of thing we should all be concerned about. Um, TOTP is another semi-common uh, technique. It's time-based, one-time passwords, the six-digit numeric codes. You may have seen them before. This is gaining a bit of momentum. Uh, GitHub, Linode, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Dropbox, WordPress, Facebook, Rackspace. They, a lot of people are, are using this now. Um, you know, you've probably seen it. This is GitHub where you're you know, asked to, uh, to you know, usually it's on your phone, and you, put, you look at the number, you enter it in. GitHub caches it basically forever. Uh, other sites like Linode only for about 30 days, and then you have to redo it. I want to talk about hardware keys because I was skeptical about them initially, but I've really come to love them. Um, uh, you know, they can support different protocols, including uh, one-time passwords, but I'm going to focus on um, universal second factor, or U2F, um, and its uh, successor, which is called web authentication. Um, and these are, are great for a number of reasons. It's USB-based, they're tiny, very portable. Um, it's they're really hard to exfiltrate data out of these. Um, the downsides is they're not widely supported. Um, you know, in terms of web applications, GitHub, Google, Dropbox, and some others here and there. A lot, a lot of room left to grow there. Um, the browser support, also not great. Um, only 29% of the current global population uses a browser that officially supports U2F. And, and basically all of that 29% is Chrome. Um, Firefox, Firefox support was added in 57 um, behind a feature flag. 
Um, but it's a little flaky in my experience. Um, and it's again, it's behind a feature flag. It, it needs to be brought front and center. Um, there's also a Safari extension. It's also immature. I couldn't really get it to work. Um, but hopefully those will, things will change as developers continue to, um, to improve them. Um, so this is, you know, this is one of my you know, calls to actions, um, which is you know, how do we get better multi-factor authentication support? You know, first is applying a pressure to both sides. You know, the, the, sites, the, the sites you use, you know, your banks, your health insurance uh, sites, uh, any, your most valuable data, you, know, you really want to use those. Um, uh, and then browser vendors. So Firefox, Apple, you know, try, to, try to warn them about it. Um, protect your users. Um, you know, pressure, pressuring you know, these folks is great, but like build in multi-factor authentication in your own applications. Um, you know, when I built Fortress, I was determined it was going to have it from day one, and, and from now on, every project I build is going to have it. Um, Django U2F is a fantastic tool for this. Uh, it supports U2F, one-time passwords, backup emergency codes. Um, I was really impressed with it. Um, from a fresh Django 1.11, at Django admin start project skeleton. Um, I was up and running in minutes. Um, come and find me, and I will show you how easy this is. Um, if, you, if you're all interested, please come and find me. Um, to help, I can help you add it to your own applications. So um, we all deserve a reasonable degree of privacy and security in our lives, but we're only going to get it um, if we are adamant about demanding it, and, and we are vocal about it, and we build it into the things that, that we build. Um, so, you know, if you are building a web application, let people delete their data, let people delete their accounts. Um, think about how you would feel if, you know, as you as the user. So again, um, I've used up all my time, um, don't have time for questions, but I would love to meet you and talk to you. Um, and I want to learn from you as well and learn what kinds of things that, you know, your experiences in this area. So please come and say hello. Thank you all for coming today.